Yeah, thanks uh, to Carl and to Prosper for inviting me uh, today, and also thanks uh, to the Henry Halloran Trust um, and Sydney University for having me over for my internship. Unfortunately, I have to do a bit of work as well, but anyway, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the um, macroeconomic situation uh, in Australia and more generally in advanced economies uh, with a focus on uh, land and, and finance. That's going to be the, the uh, thrust of my talk. Just to give you a quick background on me, Carl's already mentioned uh, one of my books, um, but I, uh, my sort of intellectual journey um, started, uh, I used to work at the New Economics Foundation, which is a, a think tank in London, where I was sort of introduced to the, the idea that um, money and credit uh, and also land were rather missing from um, the conventional mainstream economics textbooks, uh, and that this might just be an explanation for why we were having some of the issues uh, in, in modern economies, uh, not least the, the global financial crisis. So it was a bit of a sort of, I was working there in 2008, 2009, in a sort of a, a bit of a wake-up call there, the intellectual environment uh, and what was, was going on around me. Um, so I've written a, a, a book on, on the monetary system in 2012, sort of explains how banks create money rather than just recycling it from borrowers to, uh, uh, from lenders to, to borrowers. Uh, and most recently, I've, I've published another short, short book, um, which is here actually, called Why Can't You Afford a Home, which has been very popular, um, unsurprisingly, because um, in cities like Melbourne, obviously, uh, a lot of people can no longer afford to, to buy a home. So that's a bit about me, but the topic of the talk uh, is um, uh, what, 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 you know, what are we doing macroeconomically uh, in, in today's advanced economies? Um, and uh, what's interesting, of course, about being here in Australia is that you are a bit of an outlier uh, compared to most other advanced economies. In fact, nearly all, really. So it's hard to think of one uh, which had a better global financial crisis than you guys. Um, uh, uh, so it's kind of it's an interesting economy from that perspective. Um, you haven't had to cut interest rates. You didn't cut interest rates down to the zero lower bound. Um, in fact, they only got to 3%, it looks like, according to this chart, which was, you know, was pretty much normal, um, relatively uh, speaking. Um, but more recently, uh, you seem to be heading down that path. Um, and uh, a warning signal, I guess, is, is what I, the first thing I'd like to say, um, because once you get down to that uh, below 1%, interest rates, uh, the history suggests it's very hard to get out. It's very hard to get back up. Uh, so if you have a look at Japan there uh, in the top right box, um, it's a, it's a very, the chart isn't, isn't very, um, doesn't go back long enough, but, but it's been down there uh, since the early 1990s and it hasn't really managed to get back up. They've had this sort of deflationary, uh, relatively low growth, high debt um, macroeconomic regime and it's the same regime that we now see uh, throughout Europe, essentially, and in the UK, um, and uh, in a number of other countries uh, uh, more similar to yourselves, uh, such as Canada, for example, um, Switzerland, Sweden. Switzerland and Sweden have, have gone even below the zero lower bound. They have negative interest rates, uh, but still it doesn't seem to be working. The medicine doesn't seem to be working. It doesn't seem to be able to reflate the economy even when you can invest essentially at, uh, at, at no cost or at zero, at zero, at negative cost uh, and holding money actually costs you, costs you money or, or certainly for the banking system it costs them money. So uh, it doesn't seem to be working this policy and of course central banks have gone much further than this uh, because they've engaged in these massive asset purchase programs, quantitative easing, uh, to try and target longer term, medium and longer term interest rates um, uh, with the view that once you know, short-term interest rates are at zero, you know, the next thing to do is to go to long-term government bonds. Uh, those are also negative in a number of, of countries today. Um, but, but, but still, it doesn't seem to be working. So you know, why is this? What's, what's going on? Just to illustrate this point, though, that once you're down there, <laughs> it's very hard to get out. This is a brilliant chart uh, that the Resolution Foundation, a think tank in the UK, 
produced a few years ago. It's the Bank of England's uh, market forecasts of future interest rates. So this is their, they, they go around talking to market participants. This is what market participants tell them is going to happen. You know, so in 2010, they thought interest rates would be back up to 4% um, uh, within, a, within a, a couple of years. Um, and then as you sort of go on by 2013, there's a bit more, oh, maybe we'll get to 2% in a couple of years. And then it's flattening out, basically. Um, and we're not, we're not going anywhere here. We're stuck. We're basically stuck at this, uh, this very low uh, level. And that's the danger, I think, for, for Australian monetary policymakers uh, and, 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 and government more, more generally um, when you rely too heavily just on interest rates to try and stimulate the economy. Having said that, it does appear, it does appear that again you are an outlier because the interest rate cuts, the more recent ones, do seem to have led to a significant pickup in uh, uh, the housing uh, market. Um, uh, of course, there are other factors. Uh, you had this uh, election, which uh, we were all very uh, disappointed about in the UK, I must say. Um, but um, uh, although it gives me some hope for the Labour Party, uh, the polls were completely wrong. That, we, that they may be wrong in the UK as well. It's kind of not quite the right parallel, but anyway, um, some hope there. But also interesting, you had this relaxation of the of the seven percent uh, mortgage rate serviceability rule that the um, your financial regular later uh, uh, loosened, uh, and that for me uh, uh, looks like it was it was quite a significant factor. Um, and I'll talk more about why that's important as we as we go on. Um, but my argument essentially is that it's, it's not so much, the issue is not so much the price of money and credit, although clearly lower interest rates are a factor. Um, it's, it's where that money and that credit created by the banking system uh, is allocated in the economy. And this is the issue that economists, mainstream economists, conventional economists, and sadly policymakers have just ignored for too long. Um, and you can see here the Australian data on outstanding loans, so the stock of loans, relative to GDP for the household sector and for non-financial businesses. Uh, so the textbook role of banks is you lend to businesses, the businesses invest, uh, they pay their workers, they take risks, they you know, innovate, uh, the economy grows, you have productive growth, productivity in, in improves. But but banks no longer do that, primarily. Increasingly, banks are primarily uh, real estate lenders. Uh, they lend against existing assets, as most mortgage loans are to buy existing houses on existing land. Okay? Uh, so that is a completely different economic function, actually, and its, and its outcomes are very different. Uh, and this is what's happened in Australia, and it's what's happened, actually, in nearly every advanced economy. Uh, and interestingly, the sort of uh, switching point uh, is, a, is around 1990 or a little bit later in most, in most countries, actually. But, but for Anglo-Saxon economies, it's, it's, it's around 1990. The UK, the UK equivalent chart looks almost the same as this. Um, Germany is an exception, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, so, um, and of course, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the real driver of those house prices is increasing uh, land values. Um, and... Uh, uh, I'll talk more about, uh, about that. Because my central thesis, essentially, is that it's, it's when you have uh, credit banks uh, latching on to real estate uh, and, and real estate becoming their primary form of collateral and their primary um, location for their investment, uh, you get into a sort of a cycle, essentially, where um, uh, uh, credit is attracted to land it pumps up the, the value of that inherently limited and inelastic supply of land, um, and that creates even more demand for credit, of course, because people need uh, even more money to be able to buy, to buy a house, and, and round we, we go. Um, and this, this chart really just summarizes the, the sort of unique properties of land and, and credit money um, in, in advanced economies, and how they're, they're sort of polar opposites, and of course opposites attract. Right? Um, as I said, inelastic supply, in contrast, credit essentially is um, infinite. Uh, banks can create as much money as they feel confident they're able to do. 
Uh, they can even remove uh, loans from their balance sheets. So if they securitize those loans, they can remove some of them and, and round we, we go. Um, and this, this chart really just summarizes the, the sort of unique properties of land and, and credit money um, in, in advanced economies and how they're, they're sort of polar opposites. And of course, opposites attract, right? Um, as I said, inelastic supply, in contrast, credit essentially is um, infinite. Uh, banks can create as much money as they feel confident they're able to do. Uh, they can even remove uh, loans from their balance sheets. So if they securitize those loans, they can remove some of the risks. It's even not even just about purely their confidence in the ability of the uh, borrower to repay. Land is essentially fixed. Credit money moves around. Land increases in value through time. It enables the collection of economic rent. Credit m money will decrease in value, assuming you have inflation, um, unless something's done with it, unless it's invested, unless it's, it's lent. Um, and of course, land and credit have these important, different positive and negative economic roles. Land can be a, is a consumption good, it has a use value, but it's also a financial asset. Money can support investment or it can inflate existing assets. And this is a sort of core argument I make in, in, um, in my work in both those books that were mentioned. Um, uh, th I mean, you can sort of start anywhere you want in this cycle, but I tend to sort of emphasize the role of financial deregulation uh, and financial innovation, the opening up of the banking system to uh, the real estate sector, which happened in Australia and the UK in the 1980s, Essentially, uh, before the 1980s, it was mainly in the UK anyway, it was mainly very conservative mutuals, building societies, savings and loans, uh, organisations where you needed to have saved for a long time, you needed a big deposit. Banks just couldn't compete, really. And there was an interest rate cartel in the UK uh, that building societies were allowed to charge a lower interest rate than banks. So banks were sort of shut out of the, of the mortgage market, sort of unimaginable today, but it was only, you know, 40 years ago. Um, so that leads to, to this increase in credit, pumps up house prices, increased supply of mortgage credit, increased mortgage debt relative to incomes, um, increased uh, house prices relative to incomes. At the same time, we've obviously had this sort of stagnation in wages um, and increased speculative demand as the expectations of future house prices feed through to investors uh, and households. And that goes round and round. And of course, what have governments done? Um, you know, have they tried to, to break this, this cycle? No, they've done absolutely the opposite. Uh, they've subsidized the demand, essentially the speculative demand for, um, for housing um, uh, with various forms of uh, home equity loans and credit guarantees, but especially for first time buyers. Um, and they've just enhanced it. They've just enhanced that enhance that cycle. Um, so, you know, my focus is kind of on why that has happened and what we might be able to do to, to break out of it. So just coming back to the chart I showed you before, if you plot uh, house prices onto that chart, um, you, can, you can see this close correlation between mortgage credit, um, household credit, and, and real house prices plotted on the right-hand axis there. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, various studies that basically agree with what I'm arguing, econometric studies by the IMF and the World Bank, which show that essentially mortgage credit, the deregulation of the banking sector statistically was the most significant thing in pushing up house prices. Of course, supply plays some role in any given region, uh, population, it, people's incomes, but by far the most important, statistically most important factor is this deregulation of the credit market. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that, this just doesn't seem to have been recognized by, uh, by policymakers who continue to emphasize supply side uh, interventions. You know, something wrong with the planning system or zoning is a big issue, rezoning is a big issue in Australia. Um, the result of all of this, of course, is that we end up in a economy uh, which is highly unequal, where the already existing asset owners who already own houses are in a much stronger position to buy more real estate than those who don't have access 
to property because they can use their existing property as collateral to leverage up, uh, get a bigger house or buy a second home. Uh, and increasingly, you're seeing a new kind of class system. You're seeing a class system. Uh, it's not so much your job that determines where you are, your opportunities in life, it's whether or not you own a house, you own some, some landed real estate. Uh, and this just shows the data um, by income quintile um, in, in the growth um, uh, uh, changes in net property wealth uh, 2004 to 2017 in Australia. The, wealth doing, the wealthy doing very well. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because many of you, will, having lived here, will be familiar with these changes. And uh, it seems that in Australia you're even more obsessed with, with house prices than we are in the UK, which is, you know, which is saying something. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, as I said, financial deregulation in the, in the early 1980s, um, uh, secondary mortgage market was established in 1980. Six. It was also a big year in the UK, 1986, that's when the Big Bang occurred, Thatcher's uh, deregulation. Um, increasing development of securitization followed that, residential mortgage-backed securities, entry of non-bank lenders into the market. Uh, 1980, uh, so that's, that's the sort of financial uh, key milestones, really. Um, uh, then there was changes to the taxation system, of course. Um, capital gains were introduced in, in the mid-80s, but no capital gains at all on uh, owner-occupied housing. Uh, and then you have this in, in the early 90s, this tax advantage superannuation guarantee scheme, which uh, leads to this negative gearing uh, process where you're pretty much the world leaders, as far as I can see, on, uh, on this. Um, kind of, we got rid of, of these kind of things in, I think, in the sort of late 90s in the UK, um, it, was, it, was, it was sort of seen as a clear kind of uh, way in which the already wealthy could just get even richer and it was, it was, it was removed, but not here, um, which is, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> um, and then you had a capital gains cut for, for, for investors on second homes. And at the same time, of course, you had uh, cuts in the capital spending on public housing, building um, uh, affordable houses uh, through the 1990s. Um, and, uh, and first-time buyer, first, first home buyer concessions, of one of the biggest ones, of course, was key in, in getting you out of the, the global financial crisis. So all of these policies in, in terms of financial regulation, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, fiscal policy, in terms of uh, housing policy, have all supported this, this process. So this is why we need to think of housing in, in that broader macroeconomic sense. Um, but you're not on your own. You're not on your own in, in going through this process, as I said. Um, and this chart just shows how in actually in all Anglo-Saxon economies, who have all engaged in this sort of housing finance cycle, uh, you've had a fall in home, uh, the rate of home ownership. Um, in fact, it's peaked um, in Australia and, and, and New Zealand as, uh, as long ago as the 1990s. Um, so you've had, despite all of these subsidies from the government, despite this explosion in mortgage credit, everyone can get a loan now, uh, actually home ownership's fallen. So it's, it's not working on its own terms, this, this policy regime. In the UK and uh, Canada uh, uh, and Australia, the peak was actually in the early 2000s um, in terms of the, the rate of home ownership. Uh, and the same pattern for Australia, as I said, um, uh, of this shift in, uh, this debt shift in bank credit applies uh, if, you, if you take an average across advanced economies. This is going back to, to 1950. And again, the shift on average is actually in the late 1990s. Um, and there's the chart going way back to 1870, uh, showing um, uh, real house prices again on the right-hand axis. Um, and this, not much evidence of a correlation between them, but once you have this deregulation, in the 1990s, 1980s, uh, a, the correlation emerges and you have this very sharp increase in, in mortgage credit and in house prices. So one argument is uh, it doesn't matter because, um, you know, the, the people's wealth is increasing, right? Their, 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 house, their house prices are going up, their real wealth is increasing, they can spend more because they're wealthier, um, I've already mentioned the inequality issue, but of course the other issue is a financial stability issue. 
and a broader kind of um, debt does, you know, is this model of sort of high debt um, driven growth actually a sensible and efficient model? And I would argue it's not because you need a, a, a lot of growth in debt to get a small increase in consumption, right? Um, uh, uh, as opposed to actually investing in, you know, uh, uh, new machinery, new services, paying people more money. That leads to big economic multiplier impacts in the economy. That's what creates long-term sustainable growth. What we're doing with this model, essentially, is we're increasing the ratio of total household debt to the value of our wealth, housing stock, um, ev every year, essentially, that, that's going up. And Australia is one of the worst offenders for that. So, yes, your housing wealth has increased, but by much less uh, than uh, household debt, which is, which is around about 120% um, of GDP uh, in this country. Uh, significantly higher, I think, than uh, the UK. Um, so that obviously creates financial instability if there is an economic shock uh, or if there's inflation and the central bank suddenly decides it needs to, to raise interest rates, right? I mean, what, what are you going to do in that scenario? Uh, and that's why it's so difficult to get out of this low interest rate, high debt sort of trap that you may or may not now be entering. Um, but we've certainly entered it in Europe and, and we're struggling to, to get out of it. So that's a sort of gloomy story. Um, but now I'm going to talk about how we, some ideas on how we do get out of this, this problem. Um, and I'm going to focus on um, some financial reforms. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about land policy uh, uh, reforms. Um, but there's, you know, in the books, there's, there's obviously more detail than I can give you here. But, but what's, you know, the good news is not every country, not every advanced economy has suffered this, this problem and has, has entered this sort of housing finance cycle. Uh, as you said, Germany is, a, is an exception, an important exception. There are some other examples. Korea, I think, is an interesting, South Korea is an interesting example. Singapore, to some extent, as well. Um, uh, th there are some countries where they, s they have done things differently, where they've got a different kind of financial system and they've got a different kind of land market. Uh, and they, they have managed to actually decrease uh, that house price to income ratio, which is shown in this, in this chart. Um, the dotted line is the Anglo-Saxon average, and it's indexed against the long-term average across um, 17 OECD countries. Um, and you can see there, uh, we have this big peak around the financial crisis but it doesn't return to anywhere near its long-term historical rate. Uh, it, actually, it actually increases again um, uh, uh, post-crisis. Um, but you can see Germany and Korea, very different dynamics. Germany actually is having a bit of a house price bubble, especially in the cities, in the big cities in Berlin and Munich. Um, but they're, going, they're coming from a very low base uh, compared to, to where we are in uh, Anglo-Saxon economies. So what, what do we do? So um, one issue is that our banking system has become essentially hooked, uh, addicted to real estate. Uh, I think that's partially to do with the types of banks that we have. Uh, in countries like Australia and the UK, we have essentially uh, large, very large shareholder-owned banks focused on fairly short-term return on equity, you know, double-digit return on equity, if possible. Um, every quarter, uh, and these types of banks, the types of loans they want to make are big loans for lots of money, uh, which are relatively safe, okay? And mortgages just hit that, on, that's just bullseye basically when it comes to mortgages because they're generally large. Uh, you get the, the house, the land as, as collateral. Land, as I said, is immobile. You can't hide it anywhere, it tends to appreciate in value. It's the ideal form of collateral for any kind of loan. Um, so if you deregulate your banking system and you allow the emergence of these large profit-oriented uh, private banks, uh, I think it's almost inevitable you end up with a banking system like you have here in Australia, which is almost identical to the one we have in the UK. In the UK, I think we have five oligopolistic banks <laughs> that completely dominate the retail market. I, I, here you have four. Um, and they've swallowed up all the smaller banks. 
um, that, that used to be more focused on lending to firms, to businesses, and actually understood local economies. That's what's, that's what's going to happen. And we make, uh, in my, my research, I make a distinction between shareholder banks and what I call stakeholder banks. And stakeholder banks are those um, that, are, that are more focused. They're not always privately owned. Sometimes they're owned by local governments, public banks, or sometimes they're cooperatively owned by the people living in the area where they, they operate. They don't demand these a double digit return on equity. Uh, they balance their lending criteria with sort of wider social and environmental goals, including access to finance. Uh, and they, they essentially they de-risk their loans, not by always demanding collateral, but by actually getting to know the firms that they work with uh, and understanding the local economy and basing the loan on the future uh, returns and the past returns that that business income that that business has generated, the revenues that business has generated. So this is, in the academic literature, it's called relationship lending, basically. Um, uh, whereas the larger banks is just a credit score system, centralized credit scoring system. Put in your data, computer says yes or computer says no, you know, that's it, basically. Um, that, that's how they operate uh, uh, today. Um, and and local, local lenders, managers of, of branches have no say, actually, in whether or not you, you get a loan. Um, so that's completely different institutional structure for these, these organizations. <coughs> And Germany has, has many of these, these type of, of groups. Um, but you also have larger state-owned or state-directed state banks. Um, the, uh, uh, the picture on the left is the Bank Centrale du Crédit Immobilier et, et Industriel, uh, which was the sort of one of basically the first European state investment bank, um, uh, funded the, 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 the building of railroads all across uh, Europe essentially enabled the Industrial Revolution. Um, and of course, what's interesting about it is its name, de Crédit Mobilier. Uh, and what we have today, of course, is Crédit Immobilier. <laughs> <laughs> we have credit that is uh, locked into uh, uh, land, real estate, which doesn't move. Uh, and that's a really important distinction, OK? Um, you're enabling stuff to happen versus uh, uh, simply inflating existing asset prices. Uh, Germany has, uh, I think, the, the largest uh, state investment bank uh, relative to GDP in the world, the KFW. Um, and the KFW uh, uh, subsidizes uh, its regional banks' um, loans, for example, for green energy, putting solar on the roof, home insulation. Uh, and they've, they're one of the world's leading investors in uh, green energy innovation. Hugely successful uh, organization, triple you know, AAA credit rating because it's state-backed. Um, we don't have this, this sort of organization in the UK, and I don't think you, you do uh, in Australia either. Um, so that's, that's a sort of uh, institutional uh, kind of critique or, or, or proposals. Um, what about uh, financial policy? Um, and I use the term financial policy intentionally because uh, we sort of, it sort of dropped out of the, of the lexicon. Um, right, we have monetary policy, uh, we have uh, macroprudential policy or prudential policy, regulating, avoiding risks, but we seem to have lost that thing in the middle, which is actually about how do we create a financial system that actually supports uh, a, a sustainable growth um, in the economy, right? Uh, uh, and that's what we've, we've forgotten how to do. Um, so. Um, I read a paper recently um, with a couple of, of economists, credit where it's due, which reviewed um, the history and theory and did some, some, some quantitative analysis of credit guidance policies um, that used to uh, be commonplace in advanced economies, basically from uh, 1945 right up to 1970, uh, 1980. Central banks working with ministries of finance and industrial policy would direct um, credit to those sectors of the economy where it was most needed, typically uh, strategic, high value added manufacturing, export industries, growth areas where you, know, you could create jobs, you could grow the economy, and they would repress credit, <coughs> typically for real estate finance, which was seen to be, uh, lead to financial instability, seen to lead to inflation. Um, uh, 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 and that was just that was how central banks operated. We didn't have this very strong emphasis on inflation and consumer price stability, and we didn't have this independence 
uh, concept. Um, the idea was uh, treasuries and, and uh, would, would, ha would support central banks in developing financial policy. Today, we, we don't do that. We have independent central banks, which essentially completely ignored asset prices uh, during the great financial crisis in the lead up to the financial crisis. Uh, they knew they were, of course, they knew house prices were going up. Uh, and they just said, it's better for us to um, clean up the mess afterwards because we don't really know if it's a bubble. Uh, we shouldn't intervene. You know, the market knows best. Um, well, they've changed their minds on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was rather too late, unfortunately. Um, so um, post-crisis, central banks have started moving back towards some of these types of policies. So this is macro prudential policy where you limit uh, loan to value incomes or uh, um, loan to income ratios. Uh, of course, Australia is a world leader on this. Uh, re your, your, your regulator, um, APRA, has instigated various policies uh, that have uh, successfully reduced uh, mortgage credit. Um, one of them was this 7% this uh, 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 thing I mentioned earlier. Um, and it, it has led to a reduction in mortgage credit. So, you know, these policies do work. Some people say, oh, credit guidance won't work in a world of um, global capital flows and mobility. Um, but the evidence actually is they, they do work. There's many other countries where they do seem to have worked. Also in Asia, they've been used um, quite successfully. So I do think there's, a, there's real room for further work there. But what we need is more proactive, you know, guiding credit, favoring the sectors we want as well as repressing mortgage credit. Now, <coughs> fiscal policy, I think, is the other you know, elephant in the room here. Um, uh, you know, it's, I, I mean, I was reading in the newspaper today that your current prime minister is obsessed with generating a budget surplus mm -hmm. this year. I mean, that is just complete kind of madness, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, you have uh, one of the lowest levels of debt to GDP uh, ratio in advanced uh, economies, about 60%. Um, uh, you have negative real interest rates on 10-year on government bonds. I mean, essentially, it's just free money, um, long-term free money. Uh, and of course, government investment can crowd in private uh, capital and investment. If you, you can de-risk the big infrastructure project, you can crowd in private sector investment. Um, the UK Labour Party has a fantastic manifesto, which I recommend everyone to look at before they probably lose the election, um, uh, where they're going to build 100,000 public housing units a year, uh, mainly funded by borrowing, because they, you know, they can see, well, we have 90% debt to GDP in the UK, but you know, they can see that this type of investment will pay for itself, right? Housing, building houses creates huge economic multiplier effects, uh, as well as reducing you know, housing income uh, benefits, uh, uh, which are, I, I know in Australia are also increasingly expensive. So if you have enough imagination, uh, you can make the case for this kind of thing. But I think tax is the other uh, massive area where clearly you can, you can make significant changes here. Um, so I'm a, I am a fan of, of the land value tax concept, um, an annual tax on the incremental increase in the unimproved uh, land value. So if you put in a new kitchen, uh, you're not going to be taxed on that new kitchen. We're just talking about the land underneath the structure, uh, the, the, the value of which is basically generated by the investment in the area, pr private or public investment, what it, whatever it may be, a new road, new metro. Uh, the homeowner has done nothing to earn that increase in value. It's a windfall gain. It's an economic rent. Um, and um, if you are able to increase the, the, the property tax. You already have property taxes here. You're ahead of us on that, on that game, of course. But obviously, they could be higher, I think. Um, and if you are uh, uh, able to increase uh, land value tax, uh, you, you can essentially you can think about it as, as just transferring some of that economic rent from the banking system, which currently capitalizes it through interest rates um, or fees from, from securitizing mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and, and you can return it uh, to, the, to, the, to the government, to the public purse, um, because by raising that land tax, you're reducing uh, the, 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 the amount of collateral um, that the bank can, can use to collateralize its, its loan. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a simple, but it's, a, I think, uh, a, 
from an economics point of view, it, it just makes sense. You know, it's just a, uh, the fairest form of, of tax. Um, it doesn't tax mobility, uh, unlike stamp duty or, or capital gains uh, that, that you pay at the end of the, uh, of the term, um, which, uh, uh, of course, economists uh, don't like. We, don't, we, we want as much mobility, labor mobility, as, as possible. Um, there's, there's no evidence, actually, that, that, that countries with higher levels of home ownership uh, are economically more successful. Uh, there's evidence, actually, that, it's, that it does reduce mobility. People become less likely to move to get a better job. It's better suiting their skills. Um, but I think an important thing with, with uh, a land value tax is its salience. Um, and Milton Friedman emphasised this in his, his, uh, his, his pronouncements on LVT. He, 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 you know, he basically said, uh, you know, the reason it's not popular is because you have to pay, uh, if you get a big cheque through the post, you don't want to pay it. Uh, income tax is taken out of your uh, pre, uh, pre is taken out of your 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 income before you see it. Um, so why don't we just do that with with LVT with property tax? They've done it in Ireland actually. They've they've introduced a property tax at a very low level, and they take it out of your of your paycheck before you see it. Um, and it, it seems to have basically worked. Um, uh, 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 and the other the other thing is of course to allow deferred payment for the asset rich but income poor, who are the, you know, the older people often who um, uh, the newspapers will tend to focus on when you introduce this kind of policy. And Prosper have written a, a, a nice paper on how to transition from uh, your, your current stamp duty to a, to a land tax with, with lots of good quality data if, for those of you who are interested. Now finally, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more generally about ownership and tenure as I said, no economic evidence that high levels of home ownership uh, supports economic growth. This is academic research. Um, but there are countries, um, coming back to my earlier examples, where you do have high levels of public ownership. Um, Singapore, 90% of the land is owned by the state. They have very low uh, corporation tax, as everyone knows, but the reason they can get, do that is because they actually, the, the government holds on to land and leases it out on 30, 40 year leases and, main, and, and keeps hold of those economic rents. Uh, South Korea has a very large land corporation that controls 50% of all residential and commercial developments. Um, and countries like Germany and Switzerland and Austria have very high levels of, of, rental, of renters and they have very secure renter rights. Um, you know, in Germany, it's just normal to bring up a family in a rented home. You can't be kicked out unless you just stop paying your rent, basically. That the, the rules favor the, the renter. So we need tenure neutrality, essentially. It's economically more efficient, it's fairer, uh, and it helps socialize those, those rents. In summary, uh, land and housing have unique economic properties. A deregulated land market will essentially lead you to a sort of monopoly or oligopoly, uh, increased rent extraction, increased inequality, uh, in particular if you match it with a deregulated banking sector, which will inevitably shift its lending towards real estate. Uh, this is an iron law, I think, increasingly of, of modern advanced economies, uh, pushing up prices, creating that feedback cycle. Um, and the role, I think, of policymakers is they've got to shape uh, the land market and, and, and regulate the financial sector to prevent this kind of scenario from happening. Thank you.